Hi everyone. Thanks for watching again or listening if you're listening. And today I'm joined by Dr. Carmen Landro. Carmen is a cardiologist and internist who lives in Houston. And she also has a business by the name of Prestige Speaking and Coaching, which I won't even start to explain because that's going to be a big part of our conversation today, exactly what Carmen does with that business, because it's a lot about who she is. Welcome, Carmen. Hi, Jan. Thank you for having me today. I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm so happy you're here, and I'm really excited to have this conversation today with you. There's several things that I'm really curious about and just want to jump right in and ask. What led you to become a cardiologist? You know, that's a great question. Um, I think from a very young age, I was inclining to science. And uh, I remember, I can tell you as far back as sixth grade, one day I, I told my dad and my teacher that I was going to be a scientist. Didn't even know what it meant to be a scientist, but that's what I wanted to be because somehow I thought I was good in science and I had to be a scientist. And, and as I grew up, the, the thought stayed in my mind that um, I wanted to be do, wanted me to be doing something science related. And then I, I, I went, I got closer to medicine in, in my, in my mind. Um, more definition. And um, when I was in college, interestingly, I took a class that was called uh, Introduction to Stress Testing. And this was given by the physical education department. And I thought it had to do with sports and running and marathons. And this was actually where you learn to read an EKG and you would, the students were taking to the cardiac rehabilitation lab um, every weekend or so. And part of our our task was to try to see the EKGs on those patients who had already had heart attacks and now they were being rehabilitated with exercise. They were on a treadmill, they were on a rower. And it's very interesting to see someone tell you, and you know, of course this was more than 20 years ago, you're, you're, you just left your, your teenager years, your early 20s, maybe it's still teenager, late teen, seeing these older folks who were almost dying, and now they're at a gym facility. Um, although it's not a gym, but it's a rehab rehabilitation facility using machines that people use at a gym, and they're rowing more than I could, walking more than I could. And it was amazing because in my mind, um, I always thought, well, someone had a heart attack. They're going to have a very poor quality of life. They're not going to be able to do many things. And this opened my mind and my eyes to the world that, this is a possibility that these people can have good quality of life and this can happen. We can do this for them. Um, and it captivated me learning about EKGs and the heart and how it works. And when I was in med school, I knew I wanted to be in cardiology, uh, but you have to go through the whole process. When you're in med school, you have to go through everything, a gynecology, surgery, family medicine, all the areas. I remember being a medical student and, Every month, as we rotated, I wanted to be whatever it was. If that month was, was obstetrics and gynecology, I was going to be an obstetrician and gynecologist. If next month was surgery, oh, no, now I'm going to be a surgeon. But then again, you know, by the time when I started rotating more into the internal medicine, the core areas, I always was fascinated by EKGs. I was always fascinated by the heart, and it was always very easy for me to, to see it. And I remember one day in med school, um, there was a friend of mine that she was having a lot of trouble understanding how to, how the EKG, how to read it, the vectors and the axes. And I don't want to get into too deep uh, medical language here, but I was like, look, this is so simple. And I took this information that seemed to be so complicated and put it in such an e such easy term that she was like, oh my God, this is the easiest anyone has told it to me. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty simple simple as me but not to everybody and you know and and as I'm as I kept going and I kept uh maybe not specializing because you still have to go through the training in internal medicine it just served to confirm that that's what I wanted to do every time I had the chance to sneak out into the cardiology department consult uh hey I'll take it I'll take that patient I'll do it just because I wanted to be there 
And it was always fascinating to me to see the cardiologist uh, sitting down, reading their echoes and seeing the heart in an, an echo is an ultrasound. Seeing just that movement of a heart in an ultrasound and how they interpreted that, that to me was fascinating. So I ended up being a cardiologist. <laughs> That's, that is fascinating. Um, and it was, it's interesting when you're talking about it, I think of both the science as you described it, but also that transformation because you were talking a lot about the transformative process. Was that a piece of it for you? It was a piece of it. Um, you know, I think, now I say a, a phrase, I, let your passion find, find you. Mm -hmm. I think my passion found me. It's always there. We all have this intrinsic ability or this talent that we don't know exists or we cannot define, but somehow we navigate and, and we go through turns and we end up leaning towards that area somehow. Um, for some people it's history. For some people it's languages, psychology. For me, it was the heart, you know, with medicine and cardiology now. Um, and it was always there. I just, didn't recognize it as mm -hmm. now, as I do now. Mm -hmm. um, and it just happens. I cannot describe to you, but yes, there's, it's a transformation. Yes, there are things that may interest you. I don't think those are um, distractions. I, I think those things that, you, that also interest you help you get formed. But in the end, you will also lean towards the main thing that's, that's attracting you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a transformation, but you still become who you who you're destined to become. Yeah, I, I agree with that approach and that. Um, uh, I think that description, as you said, it is really well, well stated. When did you decide that you wanted to go into speaking? Because you're quite the professional speaker. You're on television and you're very prominent on for the Heart Association and in other organizations as well. Yes, um, it's interesting because I have been... When you're, when you're going to medical school, you're always speaking. You're always mm -hmm. presenting in front of people. Um, it's part of what you do. As a physician, we're always asked to speak. And I never thought speaking was a career. And back in maybe 2014, I was starting to feel the effect of burnout because I opened my practice, uh, solo cardiology practice, which is crazy. And, and I've been known to do crazy things. I like to be called a pioneer more than crazy. But <laughs> Let's go with pioneer. I think pioneer, that's a great right? word. Pioneer, yeah. Right. We'll reframe. Yeah. Right. But, um, you know, I opened my practice back in 2010, um, after a few years after I graduated from cardiology and everybody told me, Oh my God, you're gutsy. And I didn't understand why <laughs> it's very complicated to have a medical practice. I know the medical part. I did not know the business part. And I started learning about it and I just had to do it because now I'm involved in this and I decided to open it. I have either two choices, either I quit or I learn it. And I quitting was not an option for me. So I had to make it happen. But uh, a few years down the road, back in 2014, I was feeling the effects of burnout. You know, I was working basically 24 seven, being a mom and a wife and a cardiologist and having patients in the hospital and in the clinic. And it takes a toll on your, on your, on your body and your mind as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the changes in healthcare, I like to think of myself as a very empathetic person. Um, and that's, that's a struggle that I have when, when I try to help someone and the system does not, does not allow it. It's very frustrating. I said, just, just like many of my colleagues, they're very frustrated and it starts to take away that fascination that you had in the end. And, and now you start thinking, why am I doing this if I cannot help others the, mm -hmm. the right way? You know. Um, so I started to feel the effects of burnout and I was looking for something else. What it was, I didn't know. Um, I glanced at, uh, I like to say I cheated on speaking a little on writing. I wanted to be a medical writer. Um, I tried it. It didn't work out. Um, no. I, I, it was not who I am. One thing I knew is that I, I loved speaking. And I realized it after I started speaking for the American Heart Association. They were asking for volunteers to be in their speaker's bureau. And I said, well, you know, I'm a cardiologist. Maybe I can say something that makes sense. 
<laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> right. I took the training when they found out I was a cardiologist and that I, oh, that I am a cardiologist and that uh, Spanish is my first language. Like they grabbed me by the hand. They never let me go because they wanted someone to reach the Hispanic community. Mm-hmm. And after that, I learned about another doctor who left medicine. Most of, most of the medical practice She's still practicing part time, but all she does right now is speaking. And that's when I connected the dots. I did not know speaking was a career and that you could do it. So I remember being at the stage, I think it was 400, 450 people in that stage. And I was feeling like fish in water. I was, this is my environment. I'm sharing my message. I'm educating people. I'm helping a lot of people at the same time. And I connected the dots. That's what I said. This is what I want to do. So I took her coaching. This doctor was giving a coaching. I I took her coaching. And then I found another coach. I I found Carol Cox, who Mm -hmm. you've invited. And and I took her coaching. And then um, that was in the fall of 2016. And after that, she did another group to help us um, just get out our our signature talk. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing course. Um, Put all these ideas that we had in our brains in one place and have them make sense and show it to the world and I mean it was fascinating how she took each and every person's thoughts and help us put them in a way that would would help us deliver our message so yeah I've been speaking formally for let's say 2015 or so Mm -hmm. um, doing the interviews with the American Heart Association doing podcast interviews doing my own my own talks with corporations Um, and once I, I discovered that this could be done, that's, that's what's happened, and I'm not stopping. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because it's also very similar to what you were saying about your path as a cardiologist. The signs and the pieces were already there, but you formalized it. it, it it's true. You know, I, I know I like to share a message. I know I like to educate. One thing patients always told me um, – in the clinic, it's like, oh my God, nobody has explained this to me the way you have. Maybe because it's easier for me to put it in simple terms. And also, I think part of the, the reason is because I like to dedicate time to them. I don't like mm-hmm. to rush through, which is very hard because you have to see so many patients. But at the same time, how can I give them the best value and service when I am rushing through them? Mm-hmm. Um, and and when especially in my in my case, I am an adult cardiologist. I'm dealing with a, an elderly population, so it's harder for them to understand many things. And I was always finding a way of how to put the information in a way that they can understand it, make it accessible to them. You know, I thought about writing the information, but it's already being done, so it would take me a lot of time. But speaking actually is a way of doing it, and you can do it to more people at the same time and then you're still educating you're still sharing a message my I, I love prevention I think if you you're it's better when you prevent a problem than to have to fix it mm-hmm. so and that's what I'm doing with my speaking as well do you ever see yourself letting your <clears throat> excuse me your private practice go you know I closed my clinic in 2016 oh, I you closed did. it oh. I did um I wasn't aware of that oh yeah yeah I closed it I I was rounding up the hospital um, seeing the patients in the clinic, of course, you have to be in between emergencies because as a cardiologist, we have mm-hmm. a lot of emergencies. I was on 24 seven, my phone never goes off. Um, and being a mom and a cardiologist. And at the same time that year, my mom got sick. My mom is a cancer survivor, but she has lots of metastasis in, in her pelvic bone. And she got a, I think it was a respiratory tract infection that got seated in her pelvis, which is Crazy to think that, that would happen, but she developed an abscess in her hip. But when you're, you're, when you're a little bit older, you don't respond the same way as when you're younger. So she got septic. She got very ill. And um, she stayed in the hospital for three months. And with that and having the, the practice and having the issues with health care, I think it was time for me to say, you know what, let me take a step back, control what I can. The clinic is some, somewhere, uh, when I'm in the clinic, I, I am it. I am the person. Yes, I have my assistants, but I am the main person. If anything happens, I have to be there present all the time. Mm-hmm. In the hospital, I have the nurses, the residents. We have a fantastic group of nurse practitioners. 
this is something I can have more help and I can still be a cardiologist. So um, I decided that it was time to maybe let's put this on hold, give my patients to another cardiologist that I trusted um, in, in the same area, and then dedicate more time, of course, to my mother, to the patients in the hospital, and then have more opportunity to develop the speaking, um, the business as a speaker as, as well. Do you ever see yourself giving up the time at the hospital and just having your prestige business? Not yet. I don't mm-hmm. think so. Um, you know, we all have bad days. <laughs> we all oh, have days. That's human, <laughs> isn't like, it? Why did I give myself into this? Yeah. Most of the times, it's not because of patient care. It's because of some administrative paperwork, mm-hmm. something. I don't think that's recent enough at, at the moment for me to do that. And one thing that's actually interesting, speaking somehow has made me got, get closer to cardiology somehow, to find that love again, that fascination again. Um, maybe because I'm a little bit more relaxed, not having the full clinic on my shoulders. Um, but also because I found some, some purpose in there as well. Mm-hmm. 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 What do you speak on besides the Amer- for the American Heart Association? What is it that you're speaking about? My talks are directed to professional women. I'd like to say professional and business women. Um, I'd like to let w- help women, not let them, help them recognize their talents and voice their achievements so that they can get to the next step in their careers and in life. I know there's a lot of women out there who have tremendous amount of talent, who have great accomplishments, but they still don't see themselves themselves as the person or the expert, or they don't see their value. They don't think that it's in their place to speak up. They don't think that they should dare to stir the pot, like I like to say it. They don't want to cause a commotion. They don't want to be somewhat, they don't want to be seen as problematic. With that said, they don't understand that when you don't speak up, when you don't let the world know who you are and what you do, no one, no one pays attention to you. You're not going to get what you deserve if you don't speak up. And that's something I learned in the hospital. It's something I learned as a cardiologist, as in training. Being in a hierarchical, male-dominated career, it's very competitive. And one thing I want to say when I was in training at my, during my second year, I was the only female. Actually, in my class, every year they take they took a they, new new trainees come in, um, and in my year of the six people that came in, I was the only female. So when the other older uh, or the higher level graduated, I was left being the new the only female trainee in the whole department. And the day to day interaction with men um, is very interesting. They're very competitive. They're very they have this special way of bonding and they have the boys club but I'm, I'm not a boy I, although I'd like to see myself as an equal many times I wasn't seen as an equal and I know that happens to other women and it doesn't fail anytime I'm at the hospital or they, they catch they, if they can catch me <laughs> they'll they'll stop me and ask me can I can I speak with you for a few minutes can I ask you a question and usually it is how do you do it how am I a mom and a cardiologist and a wife and 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 how do I do all these things that they, they think it's fantastic and that I have it all worked out? Well, I don't have it all worked out. I just make it happen for myself. And also, when we get the conversation going, they start opening up and, and commenting on certain incidents that happened, um, how they were treated unfairly, how should they approach it, um, how can they prevent being seen as the girl? Because they're not even seen as women. Many times they're seen as a girl. And this happens to women who are trainees to nurses, women who have already been graduated, have their accomplishments, and they're at a board, at a meeting, and they're seen as the girl. Um, and that's where I, where I started connecting the dots. I have been doing all this training. I have had these experiences. It doesn't happen only to me. It happens to every woman that I know. And many women will tell you, well, yeah, I, I do have to work harder in order to get my voice heard. And sometimes I think it's not working harder. Maybe it's work smarter. Let's be more objective. Let's dare to say who you are. Let's dare to say what you have accomplished. And let's dare to demand that you, what you deserve. 
Mm-hmm. With um, with that message of what I lump together as empowerment, is that an okay term to use? Yes, absolutely. Um, do you see a ready audience then at the hospital and with that group? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think the hospital is a great place um, because it's very interesting. Even in careers where women are uh, in majority, they are still not seen as the uh, person for, for the task. An example is nurses. And I've yeah. had nurses. Yeah. I have nurses tell me if there's a male nurse in the room, the patients or the family will direct their conversation to the male nurse, even if he's not the nurse taking care of the patient. Sometimes some of my, uh, the nurses in the hospital have told me, you know, they confuse me with the janitor. They don't think I'm the nurse. They think I'm the janitor that I come here or that I, I am the person that's going to bring their food, their diet. Um, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. However, they're not being accomplished or acknowledged for who they are. And, and that is a problem. That happens. I think um, from what you're saying, the part that bothers me with that is the assumption. You know, Absolutely. Um, that yeah. it's automatically made that that woman is in a certain position. And that assumption to me is the mistake. It's like, no, we don't know. So let's ask. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it happened to me. Um, I've been asked if I'm a nurse. Actually, it's funny because... I was um, at, the, at a door, trying to find at a door in the hospital, trying to find a room. And, um, you know, they put some identifiers at the patient's door. And I'm standing there. And every time I go to the hospital, I'm wearing my white coat, I have my stethoscope. Um, people know me because I've been at the same hospital for almost 16 years. But this new trainee, um, he's writing, he's sitting next to me. And he turns, he doesn't know. He turns, are you the nurse practitioner for this patient? And I looked at him. And I said, no, are you? <laughs> and, 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 you know, the attending is the, the physician that's in charge of the patient, the attending physician in that environment. So I'm the attending physician. Are you the nurse practitioner? And I know he isn't, but he needs to realize it, that you cannot make the assumption that every woman that's going to come here is going to be a nurse. Or, uh, you know, women are also doctors. Women are also cardiologists. And there's nothing wrong with nurses. And, and my, my nurses in the hospital, and I call them my nurses because I really love them. Mm-hmm. When you've worked with this team forever, it's, it becomes part of a family. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they saved my, my life many times. You know, they, these nurses who have 20, 30 years of experience, when you are there, they have this bag of tricks that when you are in the worst situation, when a patient is not responding and all the alarms are going off and you're trying to like, you know what, why don't we try this? Why don't we, I'm like, you know what, let's go. Let's just, or let me do this. I remember a specific night when um, I, when you're on call, you are the person for the whole hospital, and our hospital is huge. Um, so I had a patient in CCU, very, very critical, and this nurse, um, it, it, in this case it was a male, and he um, had about 20-something years of experience. Well, this patient has needed specific medication that requires specific preparation and a way of doing it, and I had to leave the unit for another patient. Well, the nurse that was taking care of this patient was telling me, I, I can't do this. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I never, because it's an old medication. And he comes and is like, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Go do your thing. <laughs> so he's like, go on. <laughs> so yeah, these people help you and these people help you grow. And, and it's a reality check. Like you're not the superhero sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's a team effort and we need each other. And most likely in, in the in the when I when I get all this all these experiences, I try to bring them to female uh, audience and say, look, we can do anything we want, we just cannot do it alone. And that is a big deal for women. Women do everything alone. Um, and it shouldn't be this way. Yeah, your example is a wonderful illustration of how a team effort can result in so much more than a single isolated gesture or attempt. How do you deliver your message? I mean, obviously you speak, but do you do it by lesson or inspiration or motivation? How do you reach your audience? You know, I I take my experiences. Um, I think there's a combination of motivation and inspiration 
some lessons as well. Um, and I think we all, as women, since I speak to women, um, we all have a common origin, common experiences. You know, I like to, to let women know that one of the things that happens to most of us is that women are judged by their physical appearance or by their physiology, how much makeup you're wearing, how tall you are. Men are actually judged by their accomplishments. He is mm -hmm. so-and-so, the CEO, and, and it starts at a very young age. It starts when we're little. Girls in the playground are being called ugly or chubby, or if you, if you wear eyeglasses, you're called four eyes or whatever names. And it, it's all around your physical appearance. Girls are being called bossy when they are leader, leaders, when they show leadership skills. This girl is so bossy. Mm -hmm. They're not encouraged to speak up. They're encouraged to quiet down. You cannot speak so loud. You cannot laugh as hard. Please don't run. Please don't climb. Girls don't do that. The problem is that those words have the impact of undermining your confidence. And when we're hearing them all the time, especially from such a young age, by the time we get to adulthood, we already think of ourselves as less than our peers, whether it's male or female. It's not in my place to speak up. Maybe my husband will take care of it. Maybe my brother, any male figure that we can think of, we tend to think he will be above us. And he's the one that needs to make the decisions. And that shouldn't be that way. Um, I, I invite women to take themselves out of their heads, get themselves out of that mental place, and put yourself in a position of more power and look back and say, you know, even though I had these experiences, this is how much I've accomplished. You need to speak up. Men are doing it. I take a lot from the interaction of men. I, I, take, I observe a lot, a lot, and I take a lot, a lot of hints from them. They speak up. They, just, they talk about money. They, money is not a dirty word for them. Right, right. We don't even dare to talk about money. I don't even know why. Um, maybe because I'm the one asking inappropriate questions all the time. Like no, you're me. not. I'm right there with you. I agree <laughs> completely on this money thing. Yep. You know, and, and it's interesting because when a woman is offered a job, she takes whatever they give her. We don't even dare to say, I cannot do that because at 6.30, 7 in the morning, I have to drop my kids in school. Mm -hmm. And sorry, that's my reality. I've, I've declined opportunities because, you know what, I still want to be present in my children's lives. And I'm going to be taking them to school, my husband or myself, but I, I'm going to participate in that. And I cannot guarantee that I will be every day at that time with you. So I have to decline. I've declined other opportunities because they don't go with my, my values. You know, if I decided to be more present in my family, I have to let people know this doesn't work for me. And it's very hard for a woman to say that because they're sometimes afraid to say that. Sometimes they inhibit themselves from going the extra mile, taking that position, taking that directorship or promotion because they know they're going to have to deal with either balancing home life and trying to look good at work and it's easier to just say no mm -hmm. it's easier to say no however what are the implications of not taking that next step and that's what i let women know in my in my talks yeah and what you're saying is in the in my words in the way that i put it um is that when women are actually naming and standing up with their values they do get that sense of empowerment that you're helping them see because they're owning it instead oh, yeah. of hiding it. Yeah. Um, you're a mom. I, I just um, was trying to think of a different way to say this, but do you have boys or girls? <laughs> I have little <laughs> twins. It's a girl and a boy and I have okay. a seven year old boy. <laughs> Interesting. So how do you see raising them um, in terms of a male and a female? You know, it's very interesting because I see a lot of myself in them and I see a lot of their own qualities, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, watching them grow. It's, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, if I use my girl as an example, she's with two boys. And the other day she was telling me last week and she was telling me, you know, I want to go to so-and-so's house to her friend's house because she was tired of being around boys. But at the same time, she's very active. She's very, um, 
she can be loud, although she's not loud in school, she can be loud. <laughs> uh, and she plays with the boys just like with her brothers because th that's who they are. They're, they're bro her brothers. And they're very, I don't think they know a difference. I've been trying to raise them in a way that they know that each person has their own value. I don't like to separate genders in, in the sense of this is a boy thing or a girl thing. Mm -hmm. Although they do find their way. They do know the boys are like, no, that's a girl's party. I'm not going. It's so boring. <laughs> and the girl, the girl's just like, no, I'm not going. <laughs> you know, so they find their way. But at the same time, they know that, you know, why, what my boy, one of my boys asks me all the time, but what, why aren't girls allowed? Why girls are doctors too, mom? Why can't this happen? And they, you know, there's, it's not easy to explain because in their little brains, they cannot understand that this is what happens in society because we haven't taught them. We haven't, we have never said, no, this is not your color. This is not for you. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're just growing to accept people as they are with their value. Um, of course, they're being exposed to other things and we, we correct them. You know, when, when I hear the joke that can be a little bit sexist, I let them know, you know, that's not a nice thing to say. That's mm -hmm. something that will hurt my feelings. Or whenever you say that, remember that your mom is also a woman. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying that, even though you don't mean any harm, you're also speaking against your mother and your grandmother and your sister and all these great ladies that you know. So they realize that, well, then I need to stop saying that. And that's how we do it with them. So that's how you're getting the values and the strength in there, because it's true. I mean, even in a strong family unit, there's no escaping the outer world where all these other messages come in. And it's like, oh, my goodness, you know, who said that? No, we don't we don't think that way. We don't believe that. Um, so counteracting that and teaching really is the way that you're doing that. And that's yeah. our responsibility as parents. We have to teach them. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of getting into the their level, you know, at their level, not using huge words and long sentences. And as they grow, the explanation evolves, of course. There are going to be new challenges. But I think we've been very active in letting them know that, especially because they see us. You know, kids, they watch you, even mm -hmm. though you don't realize it. They're observing you, and they see mom going to work every day. They see mom wearing a white coat, and, and they come with me to the hospital. And they see that um, even though they don't go in the ward, they, they stay with the nurses. Um, they see that I'm doing something. And they see me on TV. And there's mom on TV speaking again. And, you know, they try to imitate. Um, I, th I think it helps them when you give an example and when you, when you teach them, when you take the time to teach them. Yeah. And even the hospital staff is teaching them by how they refer and how they treat you also with the respect and all of that. So they see that example as well, which is a positive one. That's true. That's true. They, they see it. They, I, I don't even know how to describe it because children are so fascinating, you know, how they, how they grow and develop and evolve. And, um, and one thing leads to another, just like you say, they see it, they understand it without even an explanation sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and they acknowledge it and, and they let other people know as well. They're very vocal which is a problem sometimes because children speak the truth. <laughs> yeah, there are little teachers in a way. <laughs> they are. And sometimes you have to tell them, you know, it's true what you're saying, but we cannot say it here. Let's just keep it. We'll talk about it at home. So <laughs> you don't need to be correcting everyone, <laughs> everyone that you encounter. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they learn. And they'll, I think we're doing a good job there, hopefully. <laughs> we're doing a good job. Um, but I hope it's my little grain of sand into letting the world understand that we, either we see things differently and we actually acknowledge that women have value and that everybody's an equal. Mm -hmm. Until we do that, we will never get any further. We will just continue circulating the same beliefs that are putting people down. See, and I, I see what you're um, saying as the way that it will be changing because through your work you are doing that and through your children because your children are being raised in a way that is a testimony to it so it carries it through yeah i like to think that way i like to make the difference 
Um, and when people ask me, I, I think that speaking and medicine are connected. You know, in my case, they're very connected. I see both as trying to make a difference. I went to medicine, medical school, just because I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though I'm not saving lives when I speak, I, I think I'm still making a difference, you know? You think? I don't know. I think you could be in the proverbial sense, yes. I think there are times when um, there are people in despair and speaking can give hope. It can change a viewpoint. It can give a different approach to the next step in life. And you, you're providing that. And so in that's, that way, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yes, yes. You know, it's, I, I like to see it as um, my contribution. Um, you know, it's something that I, uh, I'm inclined to do. I just don't know why. I just, just do it because it's, it's my passion. It's, it's what I do. I like to say it that way. It's what I do. And, and it's so satisfying. The satisfaction when I come out of a talk and women approach me and tell me, you know, this was an eye opener because of you. Now I'm going, I I took a lot of notes because of you. Now I'm going to speak up and I'm going to approach this that I've been trying to do for years, but I never dare to do. Um, And that difference that making that difference is so important because instead of keeping the status quo, instead of just going with the flow and growing old and thinking, what if Mm -hmm. I see more people taking action? I see women Mm -hmm. daring to not even, not even at work, because even though my my talks are directly, mostly, mostly to corporate and the professional world, I think in the family life as well, you know, I like to think of, I tell everybody, my husband is my teammate. He, um, it's 50 50 at home. Of course, there are things that he does that I will never do because it, I dread them. And there are things that I do that I know he will never do as well. And that's okay. As long as we have our common ground with family and the kids and certain responsibilities, I think we're good. And sometimes, even in, in, in our family lives, I see women working and taking care of the home and taking care of the kids. And the man takes care of one thing, one thing at, the t- at a time when we are trying to be an octopus taking care of so many things. And when, when I speak to women and I let them know, you know, you don't have to do it all by yourself. Um, it's a teamwork. Manage your time. There are ways to manage your time. There are ways to delegate um, for, for you to succeed. In order for you to accomplish what you need to accomplish at work or at home, you have to actually take the steps. Um, it's, it's interesting that they didn't even thought about getting help, delegating, Asking their, their, their soulmate, their spouse, their children, you know, it's all on me, on me, on me. At the end of the day, I'm exhausted. Even to think, some, one lady told me, even, it even hurts to think at the end of the day because she's so tired. Aww. But you, yeah. yeah. But we need to learn to do it a different way and then put it into action. Let's say, you know what, I'm going to do this and I'm going to accomplish it. I need help and let's make it happen because for me to get to the next level, I actually need to accomplish this first step. And that's where I like to take all the experiences and and see life as a lesson um, and and deliver it to people. Yeah. So, see, that's why I think that you are uh, proverbially saving lives and speaking. (laughs) Who influenced you? You're influencing others. Who influenced and inspired you? Wow, that's... I, it's a lot of people, most of them are women. Mm-hmm. If I tell you one person, my mother, I can tell you my mother is a special lady who doesn't listen to me. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> because I'm the daughter and I always be her daughter, so she knows better. But hey, that's fine. But, you know, when I was growing up, I saw my, my mom always worked. Both my parents worked. Um, and I was fortunate enough to live in a, uh, I would say, middle, middle working class uh, subdivision. And every day I saw these women. I, I grew up, and back, back then we didn't go to pre-K. We stayed home. My grandmother would be home uh, with us. And um, I would wake up early, and I would see these women 
get ready for work, get in their cars and leave at a certain time every morning. All these women would hop in their own car and go to work. And these were secretaries, most of them assistants. You know, um, I think there was maybe one lawyer that lived in our street, a lady who was a lawyer. But all these women, as I saw my mother, I saw all these other women get in their car and drive to work. And that's what I learned. Uh, to me, that's what you did. You mm -hmm. know, see, my parents work, my mom, you go to school, you go to college, and you go to work. There's no other way. And seeing my mom working day in and day out, she would come late, um, after late, you know, in the evening, not, not late, late, but five, six in, in the evening, uh, after a whole day at work and raising us and, you know, still being a family. That, of course, created an impact in me. Um, you know, she didn't particularly like her job, but somehow she managed to excel at it. Um, her, her goal was to be a teacher, but because of, I don't know, some other things, uh, she, she would have ended up studying at night and it wasn't safe back then when she was, when she was supposed to go to college. And so she decided to go to the day classes, which they only had available for secretaries. So she, she became a secretary, but she, I, I actually saw her go from being a secretary to an executive to the different levels up to the higher level. I think it's three or four confidential secretary. That's what they mm -hmm. called them back then so she actually went up the ladder in her field even though she didn't particularly enjoy her, her work but she still managed to do it professionally and she was the one that other bosses would call other administrators would call mm -hmm. to help with a certain task and they would call her to train other younger secretaries that were coming into um, her, her office and it was very inspiring. How can you, because I love my job. You know, I love being a doctor. I love speaking. I don't think I would have succeeded. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's a need and you just do it. You make it happen. But it's amazing how she uh, was working and she was still our mom. And, you know, I remember having quality time with her. Um, we managed to make it happen. We didn't have everything, but we had what we needed. Um, and we never felt it um, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she she made it happen. Her and my dad. So I like to say her because I don't know anybody that doesn't enjoy or do she enjoyed it, but she didn't love it. Is what I want to yeah. say. And still made it happen. I still went up and you know got the promotion somehow, and she did it. That I love that story. She sounds she sounds amazing. I, I wonder if she ever felt that she was teaching when she was training the other assistants. I wonder if she got any satisfaction in that. I think she did. Um, you know, she, it's funny how she would teach them even grammar, you know, because the younger would come, the younger, she's very good with grammar. Oh my God. She was so, <laughs> and I got that from her, you know, you, you, from, yeah. from her, my dad, you have to speak properly. You have to write properly. Um, and there were no iPads back then. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and she would, she would um, guide them and she would teach them, this is how you write a letter. This is how you write a memo. I don't even know if we have memos anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I remember memos, so I know exactly what you right, meant. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, and even the, the speed writing that mm -hmm. they use, mm -hmm. She would teach them as well because back then, of course, you would have to use them and then you mm -hmm. translate that into a document. I don't know how they did it, but she was, she was, I remember her training others doing that. So it's interesting how she did it. And so she, of course, I took from her. <laughs> She's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember other people that I knew learning that and I would watch them do it and think, oh my goodness, I, it was, it was really technical to me. Yes, it was. It was absolutely. Yeah. So impressive. So she influenced you greatly, and I can see why. Who else? You know, my grandmother. I like to call her my grandmother. She's not really my grandmother. She's my dad's aunt. My father's aunt, uh, my father's mother died when he was seven. And um, his, my, my grandfather, his dad, uh, it was my, my dad and his three siblings. My dad was the oldest. Um, and my grandfather had to travel to work. He was in construction, and he would tr have to travel and back then, you know, I'm talking about 19, probably 1950s, um, 1940s, 1950s, I don't, I don't, I don't know. 
men didn't take care of children. Men were wor- at work and women would take care of the house. So one day my grandfather came to his sisters who are not married and said, you know what, I cannot take care of these four kids by myself. I can't do this. I have to work. So they said, you know what, don't, don't worry about it. We'll take care of them. So they went to actually live, my dad and his siblings, to his, with his aunts. Um, some of them were working, some of them weren't, but they were not married. So they raised him. And when I was five years old, two of his aunts, of his aunts came to live in my home. And it was the most amazing experience because now it's three generations in a house. And these ladies were born. I know my, the one I call my grandmother, she was born in 1915. And the other one was a little bit older. So I think she was born before 1910. So the values there were so rich and culture and respect and prop, you know, you have to be proper. You have to be, you serve food in a certain way. You eat, you eat at the table. You, um, you don't, you don't talk back. You, I mean, it was so many things. The closest thing I can compare this to is to downtown Abbey. And my husband is like, oh my God. <laughs> no, because when I hear them speak and these words, the word aristocrat, it's one word that I heard all my life. Oh, oh my God. So and so she thinks she's an arist- aristocrat. And I, to me, that's an abnormal word, but not to everybody, right? <laughs> when they, when they speak in that TV series, I'm seeing what I heard all my life in, in, in action in TV. It's like, so that's what she was referring to when she was talking to me, make, giving me her, you know, her, her stories and her knowledge about how things were back then. What a treasure. And, oh my God. It's so fascinating. And these women, they were seamstresses oh. and they made lace by hand. They sew by hand. Oh, yes. Everything's by hand. So, and my mom still crochets by hand. So I learned that as I was growing. So when you mix language and life experiences and history and and craft together, and I know it doesn't make sense to most people, but when you get all these things and you start creating with your hands and you put all that in something physical, you see people's culture and their environment, um, I don't know how to explain it to you. I, I see buildings um, also because my family, my, my grandfather and his, and his brothers were builders and, you know, architects and all that. So they were always in construction, building the, the, the buildings that actually form my town. Um, when you see that detail, how they build furniture, how they build a wall. And when you see it nowadays, you can compare the richness and, in, and the delicacy what, in what they're doing. So to me, that's, that's fascinating. How can you put so much of you in something? Mm-hmm. To the point that, you know, and I, maybe I'm deviating here, but to the point that now when I see buildings being destroyed, it kind of hurts. Mm-hmm. Because you're hurting part of, taking away part of history. How things were that put us where we are now. Mm-hmm. How these people give a lot of them in everything they did. Even, even cooking, even even sewing a dress, even, you know, the terminations. I remember my, my grandmother, um, one day I would bring everything to her, even, even if, if it was sewing a button. And I have to admit, not that I didn't know to sew a button, but I wanted the experience to be with her sewing. A I understand. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh my God. You can never just sew a button. How can you? No, no, no. This is how you do it. And how she would take each and, and each, you know, each step and, how she moved and, and, and how the hands worked. And I don't know, maybe it's my physician mind and my physiology mind and also the culture together. So she robbed a lot of me, you know, she, a lot of her robbed of me to the point that I have a lot of respect for authority, I have a lot of respect for how things are, but also I am able to ask why are they not in a better way? Mm-hmm. Without being, and you don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to be rude in order to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, she influenced a lot on me. Um, having a family, valuing that, valuing that as a unit that we move together, but each one of us is our own individual. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that says a lot about a person, how you can acknowledge someone for who they are, but also acknowledge where they belong. Mm-hmm. So, I think that 
and also because she was older, I can, I can relate to older people in a better way. You know, I can understand to me. So fascinating finding someone that's born in the 1910s, 1920s, still alive. Cause I yeah, think it is. they bring so much. They, they put us here where we are now Yeah. because of them we're here. So we have to respect that. We have to appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, now that you're working with older people, it's interesting because maybe some of that respect carries through. Do you think? Oh yeah, I am. Um, um, I carry myself differently. I have to tell you that. You know, I try to be um, <laughs> very proper when I do it. When I'm, when I'm especially when I'm, wearing, when I'm wearing my white coat. Um, also, because I trained with the director of the program, my mentor in cardiology was the director of the program. So I'd like to say there was no pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he has a way of, you know, you, you don't go to the hospital with your coat wide open and it's something handy. No, no, no. You stand, you stand on your two feet and you button your coat and you address people like the, with the, in the position that you are, you know, they, they have an expectation of you. And to me, that was very easy because I already carried that from, from being, you know, in that family. Um, and I translate that to how I address people. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not comfortable addressing people by their first name especially when they're older or calling them sweetie and honey uh, even though i'm in the south and everybody here is honey and sugar and sweetie i don't like it <laughs> i don't like to do that i think it's disrespectful i still address people by their title mr or mrs last name and if they have a title doctor or, or you know i still address them like that because it's something they earn it's something that they deserve um, to be named because that's who they are. Even if, honestly, I cannot think of anybody, any elder who's told me, please call me by my first name. Because I think they grew up differently and they know that's how you approach them. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I never call them grandma or mom because they're not my grandmother or my mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, not even, you know, it, it's very hard, you know, even, even my, my, grandfather I would never call him by his name because his grandpa you know he's never <laughs> his first name <laughs> yes yeah I <laughs> because, understand that you, know, you don't do that you know mm-hmm. mom is mom dad is dad um and that's who they are and that and I also teach that to my kids you know I I there's such respect there is a there's something that you have to draw the line somewhere you have to let people know that if we follow these certain rules, we can get along better. We get in less trouble. At least I do that with my children. You know, I may not like that I was stopped by, by a police officer. It is not in my place to start arguing with him right now. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can solve it later, you know, in court or pay the ticket if, if it was my fault or whatever. Just to give you an example, I don't want to get into any other argument. Or, you know, even if a teacher in school says something that is unfair, it's not your place as an elementary student to start arguing with her in front of the class. Maybe, maybe we can bring this at a later time, or maybe, you know, at this time, I'm going to accept it. I'm going to learn from this and move on. It may seem unfair, but it may not be unfair uh, in reality. That's something that happened to one of my kids the other day. And he was like, well, and like, you know what? You forgot your book. It all comes down that you forgot your book to bring your book to class. So that's a consequence of you forgetting. And sorry, I can't help you there. It's interesting as a parent um, deciding which lesson to teach, isn't it? It is. It is. And at the same time, you know, I I don't disempower them. If it's something that I understand that's being unfair, then it's in my place as a parent to speak up uh, with the adults involved and say, look, this is what's been happening. I may not justify it, but I understand why he or she reacted this way. Um, how can we fix it? How can mm-hmm. we work together so that this doesn't, doesn't happen again and that we have a better situation next time? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Um, we're going to have to bring it to a close, and I still have so many things that we didn't talk about that I would have loved to cover this time. So I'll, I'm going to ask you to come back another time in the mm-hmm. future. I'd be glad to. <laughs> couple, couple things though before we leave. Um, 
what do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned so far in your career? You know, mistakes don't define you. And this is extremely hard. In medicine, I am dealing with people's lives. Mm -hmm. We have to be perfect. Uh, or, or there's an expectation. We don't have to be perfect. There's an expectation that, that what we do has to be perfect. However, mistakes will happen. And in, in a sense, that's, that's the beauty of working as a team because other members of the team will catch up and actually help prevent mistakes from happening. Um, I don't have a lot of negative experiences because I'm very observant and I, ta I like to take good care in what I do. But of course, we cannot prevent it. And sometimes it's not even a mistake. Sometimes it's the outcome that I cannot prevent it. And I have to deal a lot with that. I have to, still have to accept that I cannot control everything. That, um, especially in medicine, people are going to die. And there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. And I have to respect when someone tells me, it's okay. I don't want you to do, to do anything. Let me go. And that's very hard. That's very hard to this day because... I want to do more, but I still have to say, you know, the patient has an autonomy and I have to respect it. And it's my time to stop now and let them do as they want to do so that they can have their dignity. And at the same time, understand that um, if things didn't go my way or the way that I expected, it is not, it may not be my fault. And it's something that doesn't say that I am not qualified enough. It's not something that will take away what I've, what I've accomplished so far. Mm -hmm. And that's still a, le a lesson to this day. Anytime it happens, it's just, <laughs> why did it happen? How could I have changed it? Um, and and, and then I think we, it, we all go through it, but we just don't, we can't let that put us down and say, you know what, I'm not good enough, I'm gonna move away. Because that's not how it works. It's flipping your theme of empowerment, really. Um, it's allowing the empowerment to come back to you, perhaps. Perhaps. Um, but it's also a way of letting women know when I, in, my, in my talks that even though you, you may have made a mistake or may, you may not have succeeded as you expected, it doesn't determine who you are. Exactly. So the power is still within, right? The power is still within. Yeah. Um, what is next for you with all you've done? What do you want to do next? What do I want to do next? Wow. There's so many things. <laughs> Steady chorus? <Yeah>. Or? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> no, I, I, want, I want to see myself as um, a woman that guides other women. Um, that offer resources to women, whether it's speaking in corporations, women in corporate world, whether it's offering other resources. Um, I am, I haven't told many people, but I, I am letting you know now, and now I'm going to have to do it because this is going to go live. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go public. I want to, I want to do my own show where I showcase women um, that bring resources to women, you know, other women who are, uh, that are resourceful, whether they bring, uh, you know, the topic of finance or law or even medicine, nice. motherhood, um, because we need that. We need that tribe of women mm -hmm. who've accomplished their things, who've done their, their thing their way, mm -hmm. and now can help me do this one thing that I'm having trouble with. Oh. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's family budget. Maybe taxes. Maybe, um, you know, maybe it's delegating, telling them that it's okay to delegate in someone to do your laundry. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to do that. I want to be that person that brings that together. Ooh, that's exciting. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's scary, but do it scary. <laughs> <laughs> when you get that point, we'll, um, we'll figure out our schedules to have you back on, on and talk about that in detail. Oh, How's absolutely. Okay. I'll be glad to do it. Before we sign off for good for today, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you'd like to share? You know, I don't know. We talk so much. I, talk, I speak so much. <laughs> um, what I want to share, what I want to tell people, if you let me give a message to other women out there, and, and I like to always say this to women, younger women, um, dare, you know, 
get out of that doubt, the get out of that self-doubt and don't think that it's not in your place to ask questions, that it's not in your place to take the challenge and uh, just go ahead and do it. And for the more mature woman that actually has, has some accomplish accomplishments on her shoulders and is also trying to still figure it out, it's okay, you got this, take a deep breath. If it's too stressful, take a break and just do it again, Try to start again. Because we don't, no one has it all figured out. And we all have to make mistakes. We all have to stop at some point. And we all learn and move on. If anybody has it figured out, I want them to contact both of us, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't want them to contact me. Um, if they want to contact me, my website is drlandrau.com, D-R-L-A-N-D-R-A-U, uh, drlandrau.com. Sorry. <laughs> And I'll have it in the um, show notes at, and your social media. Is there a place where you hang out where you'd like people to find you? Absolutely. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And it's all the same Dr. Landrow. Okay. So all of those will be in the show notes. And for now, we'll sign off. And thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. Bye, Dr. Landrow. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,